Pardon? Very brief, because it's live yes. in 30 seconds. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure that someone will show our presentation and then move the slide for me. Yes, they can help. Have you sent okay. your presentation? Have you Sorry. emailed your present? Have you emailed your presentation? Yes. Yes. I, yes. She did. No yes, problem. We will do it. We will do yes. it. No problem. Yes. Yeah. We are Thank live. You. Thank you. We're live. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, I think it's time to start. I'm checking with the organizers if that's correct. Yes, sir, whenever you're ready. Okay. Welcome everybody to this uh, session that promises to be very interesting. It's a session on risk communication, data for decision-making and evidence-based governance. I'm Joran Thompson. I'm a professor of international health systems research. I'm also the Counselor to the President of Karolinska Institute on UN Agenda 2030 and the co-founder of the Institute for Global Health Transformation. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to chair this session. Um, this session has uh, a quartet of uh, excellent presenters. Uh, and I'll take it in the order of their presentations. It's Dr. Tofik Duarder. Um, and uh, he is both a WHO consultant and uh, a vice chairperson of the Public Health Foundation of Bangladesh. He has so much on his CV, I will not read more. Then we have Dr. So U uh, from um, Myanmar, and uh, he is executive director for the Center of Economics and Social Development in Myanmar, and he sits on many different committees. Uh, thirdly, uh, we have Mr. Tofikul Islam Khan, um, and he is also uh, on uh, different uh, committees. He's uh, in the committee with the Prime Minister's office, uh, and uh, he is uh, a research fellow and coordinator of CPD. And when you do your presentation, please explain to all of us what is CPD in Bangladesh. Finally, my old friend and colleague, Dr. Mai Wan, who is the director of the Health Strategy and Policy Institute in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam, and who's been working a lot with uh, multi-sectoral approaches, as we will uh, learn when she makes her presentation. Now, let me, uh, without further ado, uh, ask Dr. Tufik Jorger to present the risk communication and health systems trust among the urban educated groups in Bangladesh. The floor is yours, Dr. Tofik. Um, am I audible? Hopefully, yes. Yeah, yes. thank you very much, uh, Yoran, and uh, um, thanks for inviting me to such an um, um, important conference on uh, on COVID-19. And as you can see on the slide, my um, presentation is risk communication and health systems trust among the urban educated groups in Bangladesh. And this is based on a study that we conducted in mid-June 2020. Um, so before going into the presentation of the findings, I want to um, um, clarify that some of the definitions so that we understand what we are talking about. Risk communication means the range of communication capacities required through the preparedness, response, and recovery phases. There are different phases of a pandemic, phases of a serious public health event such as COVID-19 to encourage informed decision-making by the decision makers, the, uh, the policy makers, etc. And also the positive behavior change uh, in part of uh, the, of the service seekers, the general people, and the maintenance of trust um, as a whole in the society. Now, what is trust? Trust implies that uh, it's an implicit understanding between two or more parties that neither will exploit the interest of uh, the other parties. And in the context of COVID-19, health system is expected to uh, basically protect the people and the health system is 
uh, and it's expected that the health system stewards, the decision makers, the, uh, the people in charge of the health system um, are not uh, exploiting the vulnerability of the people, vulnerability of the people who became vulnerable in the first place due to the, um, the COVID-19 situation, for example. Now, why this risk communication and health system trust are important? Improved risk communication improves the technical and managerial decision making of the decision makers because the decision makers need data, they need information. And if the communication is transparent, they get better data, they make better decisions. And from the, um, um, from the service seekers or the uh, demand side's perspective, it improves the care seeking, it improves the public health and satisfaction because they know um, uh, what to do, they need, know where to go, um, uh, what to do, et cetera. And these eventually improves the health system trust. If you have a good communication, you, you actually uh, have a better trust in the society and better trust fosters cooperation among the diverse stakeholders who engage in pandemic management. It garners social order, good governance, and it facilitates pandemic response activities like contact tracing and vaccination. And in a, in a pandemic situation, especially in a pandemic that, is, uh, that happens due to an unknown um, microorganism, the evidence actually changed. You get, we, we get newer data and we change our approaches towards the pandemic. And that requires a different type of leadership, which is adaptive leadership. And trust is even more important in the context of an adaptive leadership, in the, where an adaptive leadership is necessary. And trust in, and a lack of trust invokes a stigma, which is obvious. And in order to understand the situation of trust and the public perception uh, in regards to these issues, we conducted a mixed method study um, uh, which involved um, online-based questionnaire survey with 508 respondents and focus group discussions with 50 um, uh, clinicians and non-clinicians coming from different backgrounds. Now, first, I'd like to uh, share the results of the quantitative finding very briefly, then I'll go to the qualitative finding, which is more important. If you look at the average level of trust, first I need to tell that the questionnaire actually had a Likert type question from zero to 10. So an impersonal or imper interpersonal trust of 3.7 is actually not very high, um, uh, is actually quite low, 3.7 or five or whatever it is. And, uh, and we can see that impersonal trust is lower than interpersonal trust, which means that the people trust less, um, people have less trust towards the decision makers, health system decision makers and politicians. That is the impersonal in nature uh, compared to um, uh, the, the service providers where they have a kind of interpersonal relationship one-to-one. Uh, -one. And our, uh, topic of discussion today is communication and communication is one of the eight domains of trust. Um, and we see that the communication in terms of communication, uh, we uh, the people had less trust, both in terms of impersonal interpersonal, that means that uh, we have a lot to improve in terms of communication aspect of gaining trust. Now let me get into the qualitative part, which is more um, interesting and first is um, the first one is the impersonal trust, uh, qualitative findings regarding the impersonal trust. The Bangladeshi audience will remember that we did not call the lockdown. When we imposed lockdown, we did not call it a lockdown. We said, for whatever reason, I don't know why they called it a general holiday. Perhaps they wanted to avoid the panic in the population, but what, for whatever reason, they called it a general hol holiday. And uh, what happened was that as a respondent, said when the government uh, government said it's a general holiday instead of a lockdown people confuse it with something festive that's why we saw people going to Cox's Bazaar, a popular tourist destination for tourism purposes. Some of my friends even got married during this period, taking advantage of the general holiday. So you understand that when you um, uh, mess up with these terms, um, uh, it actually defeats the purpose of um, the lockdown, people get married. Um, so another thing is that uh, uh, when the first the lockdown was imposed, they imposed the lockdown for one week, uh, as if this, log, uh, this, this pandemic is going to go away after one week, which didn't ha happen, of course, we now know. Um, and they kept on increasing the day, I mean, the, the duration of this lockdown week by week, you know, every week you hear that uh, we extend it for one more week and it eventually uh, ended up um, uh, three months or so. 
uh, actually months, uh, months of lockdown period. So people, obviously, I mean, if you say people, um, people tell people that you're going to have a lockdown for one week, they get going to get prepared for one week. And there was no clear guideline like what they should do during the lockdown, how their, um, um, all the aspects of their life, their um, livelihood will be taken care of, uh, from where will they get the necessities of life, the medicine and all sorts of things. So people failed to take preparation and that gave the impression of unreadiness and unpreparedness of the of the decision makers, because why should they increase the lockdown week after week, which means they're, they don't they don't even know that what they're doing really. And that eroded the public confidence on the decision makers, leading to ineffective lockdown. Obviously, there is going to be ineffective because people had to go out uh, to do something afterwards because there was no support um, system established before giving these lockdowns. And there were, and it was supplemented by irresponsible remarks by political, some of the political leaders, some people say that we are more powerful than Corona. Corona is completely under control, which was not true. And it actually um, adversely affected the public's um, trust. Um, there were conflicting statements from different uh, responsible persons, which, were, which became evidence, um, evidenced by um, the remark by um, um, a, a public health graduate from a, a, pr a private university. Um, so you know that uh, the lifeline of the Bangladeshi economy is the ready-made garment. So what happened there is actually uh, captured through this statement made by the respondent. The BGMEA, which is the National Trade Organization of the Garment Manufacturers, ordered the garment workers to return to Dhaka uh, when it was actually a lockdown period. So they were very, um, um, they were uh, nervous uh, and they wanted to uh, open the, uh, the garment factory. So they asked the, uh, re uh, the garment workers to return to Dhaka. After they returned by thousands braving the coronavirus infection and some of them actually walked uh, hundreds of kilometers because there was no uh, there were no uh, transport facilities. There was a lockdown back then. The BGMEA suddenly declared that the factories will not open. On the other hand, the police um, announced that they will not allow anyone to enter Dhaka because it was a lockdown. So the innocent workers were caught between a rock and a hard place just because of the communication gap among different departments. And uh, there were uh, uh, examples of such miscommunication at the interpersonal level as well. Uh, for example, some doctors uh, spread different types of uh, misinformation in the social medias. They uh, they said that the corona. Some uh, one video actually became viral. A uh, doctor was saying that the corona will go away in um, um, in in a couple of months when the summer arrives. Then they uh, said that they promoted different medications, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and so and so forth. And of course, this didn't work. They are not supposed to work, and it didn't work. And the implications were actually quite understandable. They were very negative. It resulted in uh, negative uh, perceptions in the people. Uh, for example, when the schools were closed, uh, one respondent said, when the schools were closed, my mother went to Kutubdia, a distant island in Bangladesh. And I heard from her that people of Kutubdia are not even believing that any such disease even exists in reality. They think it's a hoax or a propaganda being spread by the government for a clandestine purpose. People are not maintaining any health messages delivered by the government. They are not putting on masks or not doing anything that the government was saying. And it resulted in serious level of stigma. We are seeing uh, news like returning expatriates are denied entry to their homes. Doctors are driven out of their residences. Um, elderly parents were left out. Uh, in the jungles, things like that happened. So based on all these, our recommendation is that there must be a transparency in COVID-19 data and decision-making. There should be a free flow of correct directives and information. And th those should be readily available in the government websites. Everybody should be able, able to uh, see those directives and information. And there should be um, risk communication guidelines, social and behavior changes strategies. And those strategies need to be scientifically oriented and designed by the people who are experts in this field. Bangladesh is known for its community network. So we need to actually tap into those resources. We need to engage the religious, cultural, political, and community-based forces because people people actually trust them. So we need to actually exploit those resources. And finally, stigma is not going to um, go away just 
by default or automatically. There, need, there needs to be uh, a, a explicit and clear policy and guideline to promote the culture of respect against a stigma. Otherwise, it won't go away by just by uh, itself. Um, so thank you very much for your um, uh, patience hearing. These are some thank of the Thank you so much, Tofik, yeah. from this, uh, excellent, for this excellent presentation. Um, we have now almost 100 participants, which is brilliant. Uh, I ask you kindly to take note of the questions you have. We will have an interactive general discussion once we have listened to all the presentations. And even though we may not have 100 questions, we should at least have, uh, let's say, 30 or 40. And then it's for us to try to handle this. Uh, we now move to uh, Dr. So, who will present uh, with the title, No One is Safe Until Everyone is Safe, Global and Local Gover Governance. Uh, that's a very interesting concept. You may combine it, global, global and local governance of vaccination, case of Myanmar. Word is yours, Dr. So, please. I hope we have you with us. Yes. Uh, I tried to share my presentation. Uh, did everyone um, see my presentation? Well, you have to enlarge it a bit. Ah, okay. Um, and if, if need be, uh, why don't the organizer assist you? Okay, uh, let me let me uh, change the um, because time. Ti I'm very aware of time, and we need to have a very kind of expeditious Should, way of you, dealing with technology. Doctor, did you email it? Do you want our IT colleague? To uh, I it? think I can change my uh, slides. Oh, it's done. It's done. Is that okay? Excellent. Um, Excellent. Please yes. start, Dr. So. Yes, uh, th thank, thank you, um, uh, Professor Thompson. Um, yeah, I'm going to present uh, the experience of Myanmar in, uh, with the uh, vaccination uh, process. And then I took uh, the presentation of uh, the title of my presentation from the WHO motto that no one is safe until everyone is safe, emphasizing the global and local governance of COVID-19 vaccination needs to be coordinated and uh, enhanced, but uh, unfortunately, the experience of Myanmar shows that both mechanisms are being disrupted and then mainly it is very much uh, political. Um, in my next slide, uh, and uh, I will say that uh, uh, now the Omicron is hitting the global headlines. I will say that vaccine equity is become very important uh, for uh, least developed uh, economies like Myanmar. And in, in case of Myanmar, uh, it, it is even more uh, vulnerable because uh, we have uh, experienced a complex political emergency during the recent uh, conflicts and then also the uh, takeover of the military into the governance system. And then uh, we, Myanmar, should not be left alone to handle this crisis because, you know, we are a small country, but uh, surrounded by the big uh, uh, populous uh, countries like Bangladesh and China and India. And so, Whatever happened uh, in Myanmar could also become uh, dangerous to many of our neighbors. Uh, so my advocacy is the politics should be kept out of the global mechanisms like uh, COVAX. In my next slide, um, <clears throat> and I want to uh, give you the brief uh, sketch of uh, the state of COVID-19 in the ASEAN in January uh, 2022. As you can see, Myanmar, uh, has the highest mortality rate in, in the region. It, uh, the testing capacity is also very uh, poor. It's the second lowest in terms of testing per million population. In 2021, we failed to reach the target of 40% uh, vaccinated uh, population. It's the lowest vaccination rate in the ASEAN. The ASEAN has a fairly uh, successful vaccination rates, and, but unfortunately, Myanmar is the lowest. And um, in the next slide, <clears throat> um, I wanted, because ASEAN has a both rich and poor country, so I wanted to compare Myanmar to another LDC uh, in, in, in within the ASEAN. So I pick Cambodia 
uh, which have a very similar socioeconomic conditions and the public health resources. And both have a poor records of human rights and are also subjected to the US sanctions. Plus Cambodia is even subjected to the EU sanctions. So in terms of vaccination, Myanmar started early on the vaccine rollout with the donations from India. So we started early in January, 2021, but uh, got slowed down throughout the 2021 because we didn't get any delivery of the vaccines from the COVAX regime. Whereas the Cambodia received donations from China, India, US, EU, and uh, COVAX itself. Uh, so that makes Myanmar still stuck under 25% and then Cambodia achieving 80% rates. Um, so there are three important reasons underlying the low vaccination rate in Myanmar. And I want to tell you about the, uh, these mechanisms in the next slides. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, the, the Myanmar problem is what I can say is a complex political pandemic. So we uh, suffer from never ending uh, bargetry and then also became the most vulnerable country in Southeast Asia. So the global governance on the vaccine delivery in Myanmar is politicized without any uh, precedence. And local governance uh, of the vaccination program and health system in Myanmar is also weakened and politically disrupted. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I want to give you the statistics of the COVAX uh, delivery and then I am giving you the uh, evidence that uh, within the ASEAN, all uh, 10, uh, except uh, Myanmar did not receive uh, any vaccine, vaccines from COVAX in 2021. Thailand did not sign the agreement, so they didn't receive it. Uh, the rest of the countries received more or less the 50 to 90% uh, of the COVAX uh, allocations in 2021. So I, try, I took uh, interest and in look at other countries that are subjected to international sanctions and then particularly the Western sanctions. And then I found that uh, the countries like Afghanistan, Chad, uh, Guinea, Iran, Mali, Sudan, Venezuela, uh, these are all the international paria regimes with the very poor human rights records and they are mostly under the Western sanctions. They even receive at least 30 to 50% of their doses allocated. Whereas uh, when I checked Myanmar, uh, it has already done all the WHO requirements like a readiness assessment. They already have the national deployment plan for vaccination. And then they also got the vaccination training and delivery strategy. So my question is why COVAX hasn't really delivered any vaccines to Myanmar and why Myanmar has to be, Myanmar people has to be punished uh, by not uh, getting any vaccines from COVAX. In the next slide, I also wanted to uh, follow up uh, what uh, Dr. Tofik had just mentioned about the risk communication. Uh, in our case, it is not the uh, communicator and then the recipient that are, uh, you know, are not efficient or not willing. It is the channel of communication. In the case of Myanmar, uh, it's the Facebook and the social media, which became very popular uh, channel of uh, uh, information and media uh, is carrying all kinds of misinformation and disinformation about the vaccines. So in the left uh, table, you can see Myanmar stood uh, the top country in the world in, in terms of Gallup uh, poll, which is the uh, most reputable Gallup, uh, is the most reputable polling uh, organization in the world. And they took the polls in uh, end of 2020 and Myanmar took uh, the first, and only 4% of the Myanmar population say that they are not going to take vaccines. That 4% jump to nearly 40% in August, 2021. And then the, the second survey said that 46% uh, do not want it because they don't want to, tr they don't trust the vaccines and 28% they don't trust the vaccinator. Uh, so the sudden change of country with the world's top willingness, willing populations to take the COVID-19 uh, to you know, nearly 40% of the anti-vaxxers is such a remarkable. Vaccine hesitancy is uh, caused by many factors, but uh, I would say that uh, the wave of online misinformation leads to such reversal of public percep perceptions. And uh, the public anger and resistance caused by the military takeover in February, 2021, 
provided a new stream, but a rapid spread of false or misleading information regarding the Chinese vaccines and military government vaccine rollout plan. The Facebook was the most prolific source of misinformation, propaganda and conspiracy theories against the Myanmar, uh, but uh, and the, uh, against the military government and the anti-vaccination fake news and propaganda slipped through under the campaigns against the military takeover. The last reason uh, has to do with the political crisis and then uh, the violence against or obstruction of healthcare in Myanmar under rising conflicts also disrupted the rollouts. Uh, it's a report done by the Physicians for Human Rights and a number of human rights organizations suggest that the ongoing conflicts in Myanmar disrupted the rollouts uh, program and then also the public health system in the country. But in addition, the civil disobedience movement of the government appointed doctors against the military government also brought the Myanmar fragile healthcare system to a breaking point under the weight of uh, pandemics. Uh, unlike uh, doctors and nurses strikes as well, Myanmar CDM movement did not result in a mediated outcome for better health system, but the deserted healthcare facilities across the country. So my question is the ethical dilemmas facing the CDM movement of medical professionals in Myanmar is going to be much uh, growing larger in the wake of a new wave of Omicron. So my, uh, my conclusion is uh, Myanmar is struggling today to meet 70% uh, of targeted uh, vaccination in 2021 uh, with the donations that they have collected from friendly countries such as China, India, Russia, and but they mainly purchase uh, out of China uh, to continue with the vaccination rollout. The US has been contemplating the vaccine donation, but uh, no modus operandi was developed so far. So in this case, I would uh, urge the ASEAN, uh, which champion uh, in the past to handle the humanitarian uh, assistance delivery to Myanmar in the wake of a cyclone Nagis in 2008, they might be able to reactivate the tripartite mechanisms to manage the vaccine delivery together with the good offices of the United Nations and the ASEAN. And I would also beg your uh, attention to help us uh, because uh, Myanmar is such a pivotal country within the region and when the Myanmar is not safe and none of the, our neighbors will be safe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. So. Um, so much food for thought. The number of participants is increasing, but I don't see that many Q&As or rather questions or issues in the chat box. I strongly encourage everybody to, um, you know, pose questions or comments or whatever, so that we'll have a lively discussion. We'll now move into the third presentation which is uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Tofikul, and uh, it's about how data initiatives helped our fight against COVID-19 in Bangladesh. Word is yours, sir. Uh, uh, you have also requested me to uh, tell a few words about the Center for Policy Dialogue. Um, Center for Policy Dialogue. Uh, is as long as you keep within 10 minutes, I, everything I, I, is fine. I, 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 will, I will keep the time. I know your, your concern. Uh, so, Yes, uh, Center for Policy of CPD is a premier think tank in Bangladesh. Uh, so we work on uh, policy issues. Uh, we focus mainly on economic policy, uh, not too much uh, on he health policy, but our interest lies with uh, uh, data and uh, how we use uh, data for policy making. So as I uh, move uh, with my presentation and I'll share my screen, but I would also uh, like to share uh, my presentation with uh, all the participants. So I'm sharing it now so that uh, I, I do not have to read out everything. If you have interest, you, you can uh, actually read it out. Um, so let me now move into my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is part of a study we have uh, done recently. Uh, it is uh, under the publication process at this moment. And we, we have done this uh, study uh, with, along with my uh, co-authors. Uh, what we try to look at is that uh, we have observed that there has been uh, quite a few uh, data initiatives emerged uh, during the pandemic times. And this is mainly to address uh, the pandemic uh, issues. 
and uh, policymakers were interested, people were also interested. So we want to review and document this process, uh, the tools, the kind of partnerships uh, of, uh, that emerged during the pandemic times to, to actually uh, uh, from the both demand side and supply side. And then we would also like to uh, uh, look at how this has helped it in, in terms of translating these uh, statistics into policy making. So uh, this is the second area uh, of our interest. So we had our hypothesis uh, before we started the study, looked into uh, this uh, hypothesis through KIIs and secondary information, uh, reviewing the websites and other uh, forms of, uh, forms of uh, instruments. I'm um, basically focusing uh, during this presentation on the health-related COVID data initiatives. So uh, we uh, try to, uh, uh, to try to divide this uh, data uh, from uh, promotive, uh, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative uh, uh, domains. And also we have uh, diff reviewed different data products, six of them. Um, uh, as we move forward, I will explain a bit more. So um, what we have found that uh, one of the major sources was, as expected, was DGHS, which this is the uh, Director General of uh, uh, Health Services, uh, the major uh, responsible uh, government organization uh, in terms of uh, addressing the pandemic. Uh, and we have other organizations. Uh, we, what we have seen that mostly data came uh, to the preventive care, and uh, there are other instruments that I will uh, go through. So you, you can see that uh, press releases uh, were also used uh, to quite uh, a large extent. And uh, we have also seen uh, that uh, there, there is a new data, data dashboard and things like that. Social media was also used uh, quite uh, uh, frequently uh, to spread the messages and uh, information. So the, uh, what are the summary of observations uh, from this perspective? First, Definitely, there, there has been a sheer number of data initiatives, and it is quite overwhelming. But what we have found, there is no uh, central data repository uh, as such uh, for different data initiatives. Um, second, we have what we have found is that the majority of this data initiative focused more on the preventive and curative aspect, not so much on the rehabilitative aspect. This is probably due to the fact that uh, we we are now trying to prevent it. Uh, and... Sorry. Okay, uh, I can continue. Uh, so, but I think as we move forward with this pandemic, we will have more focus on our rehabilitative measures for which data is not uh, collected at this moment. Um, the third one is that mostly it is, uh, as I said, uh, mostly done by DH, uh, DGHS and its various wings. Uh, the fourth is that some, for dumb, some data points, uh, the sources are often uh, reported from different initiatives. So difference in reporting time and frequency sometimes at the uh, user level created confusion. Uh, so there is no real mechanism to actually um, have a coherent uh, approach to this end. The fifth one, as I see that, uh, it, uh, that in terms of regularly providing up to date data, I think there has been a considerable improvement. Online availability has been an issue, but then again, uh, there are some concern about digital divide because a large section of uh, population, particularly the marginalized section of the population, they do not have access uh, to this, uh, these processes. Um, finally, uh, I think uh, data dissemination also uh, took a more multi-pronged approach. Now, looking back to our hypothesis, has there been an institutional mechanism? Yes, there has been an institutional mechanism to collect data, uh, but uh, this is done both uh, from the demand side and supply side and created an opportunity to have more partnership between government and non-government entities. And this is something new in Bangladesh. Uh, I think, uh, uh, to, to, to have such partnerships in uh, such a large extent. There has been partnership between government and non-government in terms of he health related data. Uh, but I think uh, during the pandemic, this is one of the positive and brightest side. The second thing is that innovative data initiatives were taken uh, to this, um, to a large extent. That, that is also true. 
and uh, this is uh, we have used uh, user user generated data and telecom data uh, to quite uh, quite an extended uh, extent. Uh, so the second thing is, uh, is there an integration and coordination consolidation mechanism for uh, institution? Uh, no, uh, there has not been uh, many such cases to this extent. DGHS has a platform which was used. Um, systematic documentation was missing, and this is one of the concerns we have. So uh, in terms of hypothesis, uh, this is, has not been the major uh, priority at this moment. Uh, now, looking at how it has been used in the policies, uh, first uh, is that uh, we uh, think that uh, the policy use of data has been limited. The, the yeah. amount of data and uh, it do not match, uh, it does not match with the extent of uh, policy use. Uh, so, uh, to a large extent, this is due to the fact that policymakers were not ready to accommodate uh, such rapid extension of uh, data initiatives uh, at this moment. So it grew quite slowly. And then uh, new data obviously contributed to policy actions, but the demand from various policy actions were not totally made. So then we asked the question that can we adapt this system? Can we uh, ensure adaptation uh, to, to system-wise uh, approach? Uh, we need to have an institutional architecture, clear one, including the uh, uh, legalistic, but also institutional and involving uh, multi-stakeholder approach will be very important in this way. Uh, and also we think that there is a need to create a, a knowledge hub because the pandemic is yet to be over as well. The second thing that we want to say, can we scale it up for beyond the pandemic, beyond health sector? I, I, we think that there is, there is an opportunity, both within and outside the government. And uh, formation of a data community uh, is now, I think, that since we have learned the, uh, the importance of data, uh, I think there is an opportunity there. Um, Sustainability, uh, at this moment, uh, we have not found any sustainability uh, uh, approach uh, from the government. We, we are uh, still busy uh, in, in accumulating or addressing the pandemic, but I think uh, that there is a, a, an opportunity there, but it will need more financial human resource and technology. And finally, I think uh, what we have found, we. Uh, we have uh, heard this from time to time and from almost everyone that there is a uh, very, very important role of political buy-in and uh, the, uh, uh, the capacity development, the sensitization of the policymakers will become a, a major issue. So documenting of this evidence is the success of this evidence is how we, we have done uh, better with better uh, technology and data will be very, very important uh, uh, in the coming days not only to address the pandemic, but also uh, to uh, actually uh, implement our development uh, initiatives. Um, thank you very much. I will accept the questions. Um, thank you so much, Tofikol, for uh, yet another very rich presentation. Let me remind all presenters that we are now collecting questions and we are not forgetting the questions that are being posed. Some of the questions are directed to one of you as individuals, some are more general, but we will soon have that uh, discussion. It's now my pleasure to invite uh, Mai Wan to present uh, her paper on intersectoral action and community engagement in controlling COVID-19 in Vietnam. Mai Wan, word is yours. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Zorang Thompson and um, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to att attend this uh, very interesting conference uh, on the COVID-19 preventions. So in these sessions, uh, I would like to share with you on the uh, case of Vietnam regarding the issue of intersectorial and community engagement in controlling COVID-19. So uh, can I move to, yes. Um, so, uh, intersectorial collaborations um, play a very important role in controlling uh, COVID-19 in Vietnam. Uh, and, and in order to prevent um, COVID-19 prevention, the whole society 
engaged in preventing and controlling COVID-19, of which the government has provided strong leadership by establishing the National Steering Committee on COVID-19 Prevention and Control at very early stage since January 2020, within a week of the first few cases being reported in Vietnam. So the National Steering Committee was first led by um, our uh, Deputy Prime Minister and now by the Prime Minister. And it is a multi-ministerial and multi-sectorial committee. The presence of key ministers and parties in the committee enables to make crucial decisions and systematically coordinate the implementation of containment measures. So 100% of provinces and 100% of districts in Vietnam uh, Established the COVID 19 steering committee. So, in the committee, Ministry of Health um, plays the key role in the effort of coordinate COVID 19 containment measures among its sub agencies and other ministries. So, it provides technical guidelines for prevention, treatment, and surveillance and monitoring. And other ministries include Ministry of Public Security, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Justice, and Ministry of Information and Communication. And the Central Party and also National Assembly uh, and Vietnam Fatherland Front also participated in this committee as well. So I would like to give you some example on what is responsibility of the uh, related ministries. So for example, like the Ministry of Defense, they mobilized more than 100,000 officers and soldiers and 10,000 military health workers. And their main task of the military uh, include supplying food for people during uh, lockdown periods. And they also support the health sector in testing and vaccination and also management of the common disease and COVID-19 and coordinating of the patient transportation and reference. They also participate in COVID-19 checkpoint, coordinating with police and other sectors to ensure people comply with COVID-19 prevention and control policies. Uh, and they play very important role in transporting goods and supply to provinces during the COVID um, periods. And another thing is that like the Ministry of Public Security, they also mobilize more than 120,000 police officers and the police force participate in ensuring security of the whole society in the epidemic situations. And Ministry of Information and Communication, they um, ensure the communicated uniform, timely and accurate information about the epidemic situation as well as the government viewpoint, direction and solutions. So you can see that each ministry, of, uh, each ministry they are responsible for different tasks. And the Vietnamese government uh, recognized the fight and role of community in preventing COVID-19. So the government mobilized communities and empowered them to prevent and stop the spread of the pandemic. The government provides timely, a clear, transparent, and tailored information, as well as meaningful dialogues to reduce anxieties and fear among the populations. So the government uh, uh, recommends and pushes the people uh, to play as active role with the slogan as uh, every citizen must be a soldier in uh, against the disease. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. And in order to promote actively engagement of community in preventing the pandemic, the government of Vietnam has implemented different communication activities to improve awareness and understanding of people on the importance of their responsibility in preventing COVID. So in the communities, this improves the trust of population to the government and lead to their compliance in implementations. The government requires involvement and accountability of all stakeholders and local authority in preventing COVID, in which emphasize the role of community network and primary health care in providing communication and detecting suspected cases of community at risk. So what the community has done to reduce 
transmission of COVID. At the individual level, the pupil cell reported their health status daily. And they are practically declared declare when detecting suspected cases to the government, to the community leaders. And also uh, at the individual level, they comply to practice preventive measures of COVID. And also the peer education on preventing COVID uh, is also made between the individuals. At the community levels, um, we provide communication activities and also the community visit household for monitoring the implementation and detect suspected cases or community at risk. And also many volunteer activity support, such, such as um, the contributing money or in kinds to prevent COVID or participating in volu voluntary work. So um, for the final slides, uh, I would like to share with you on the three key lessons learned that we learned from the four ways of the COVID-19 in Vietnam. Commitment and determination of the country leaders is very important. And also engagement of the entire political system and multi-stakeholders play very important role in preventing COVID-19, in which community empowerment, uh, it is very necessity. So when they are empowered, they will be actively uh, participating in preventing uh, COVID measures. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, Mai Wan, uh, for this very clear presentation. Let me uh, allow me a few general reflections. First of all, thank you all presenters for keeping time. Then uh, for those that don't know me, uh, a few personal things. Between 84, 1984 and 1991, I was annually doing work and uh, assessing systems in Bangladesh. I have very fond memories of those days. 1992 to 2004, I was a regular visitor in different projects and policy development in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Very fond memories. I have never been to Myanmar, but uh, having listening, listened to that presentation, uh, I would very much like to. Now, a few before we go into the overall discussion, I was asked to make a kind of quick summary. I'm just going to follow chronologically the presentations and share some concepts the importance of trust, the importance of transparency, the importance of culture, the challenge with politics. We heard that politics should not influence. On the other hand, the other side of the coin, we just heard that politics with good leadership has a major importance in a positive way. We also heard the need for and lack of international solidarity. This leads to one of the pieces I'm working a lot with, together with the president of Karolinska Institute, that namely governance, good governance and solidarity between countries. We also heard how very quickly and in a dramatic way, the perception and acceptance of vaccine can change from being almost 100% to be very little. So much can happen if things go wrong. We also heard about geopolitics and sanctions and the impact of sanctions. We heard about the importance of well-functioning inst institutions. We heard about almost an overload of different initiatives that have to converge in a way. We heard about uh, different types of institutions, including from Bangladesh, for example, the Center for Policy Dialogue, but also the strategy center that my one is leading in Vietnam. We heard about challenges 
when it comes to knowledge translation. And finally, we heard about the importance of whole of society and multi or intersectoral collaboration. We are just having a piece of that uh, accepted in BMJ. I'm uh, very happy to interact more with you, uh, my one. And when I listen to how Vietnam uh, deals with this, uh, I would like to, for everybody, clarify uh, my and my president's uh, perception on how collaboration internationally should be. I would suggest to Swedish decision makers uh, that uh, they should learn from how Vietnam, the approach of Vietnam, addressing this with the with a true multi and intersectoral approach. I call that reverse innovation. I will get back in the final round, ask each and one, every one of you, what you learned from listening to other presenters. But before that, I want to open up. Uh, we now have a number of chats and uh, uh, questions. And um, ask the organizers to. Yuran, do you want me to read out some of the questions? There's about six yeah, questions. Yes, do do it in this wonderful way. You always deal with things. Uh, and, I, I'm going to try my best. So there's a I couple. Tr of questions. I trust. I trust you. And if the question is directed to one specific individual, uh, please do that. So I'm assuming you, one's Sabina. for Bangladesh which is under which ministry, but others can respond, under which ministry the central data repository should be situated. Another question is around, do you think there needs to be serious buy-in and understanding from the top, people at the top in relation to compliance when it comes to, I guess, uh, practices and prevention and protection? What does accountability mean? This is directed to Vietnam for wait, individual wait. citizens taking official yeah, measures. Yeah, 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 fine. So we have three questions. Uh, who wants to start to respond? Uh, and don't be shy. Uh, just uh, just take the floor, please. And uh, do it succinctly, not too long responses. Who wants to start? Uh, let, let me go first. Uh, the first question on the central data repository. I, I guess uh, this is directed to me. Um, we, we think, according to the, the legal system or institutional structure here in Bangladesh, uh, the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics uh, should be uh, the uh, the custodian of all data in Bangladesh. So uh, if we have a central depository, and we're not talking about uh, the health-related data, but also socioeconomic data, uh, which, which are also important to address COVID, uh, I think uh, BBS can be the correct uh, government agency. Okay, I'm checking if anybody of your countrymen wants to uh, chip in. It doesn't seem so. So the next question, Sabina, who is, which one is that? There was a question around how, how much of a buy-in do we need from the top around compliance, around COVID behaviors? Another yeah. one was accountability. Wait, wait, wait. We take, we take, one, we take one in a, uh, at, at, at the time. So Okay. Sure. Is, is this, uh, to understand the question, is it, uh, is it a question also to the political, regarding the political leaders? Is that included? Yes, in it's directed at the political leaders. Okay, here I want everybody to respond. Uh, and uh, we can start with uh, my one. Yes, uh, you, you, it is on the, on the, on the round of the, of the uh, political. Dr. Zorang Thompson? That's how I understood it. I don't have the question, but Sabrina yeah. will... Do you uh... think there are, ought to be serious buy-in and understanding from the top in relation to compliance, as we see, and the person quoted the example of a prime minister of UK who did not even know he was at a party of 100 invites, but thought it was a work event. So it's really about asking political leadership and their accountability Yeah. and buy-in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the clarifications. So, uh, in in uh, in Vietnam, where we mentioned about the political uh, commitment and and the leadership, uh, it is that um, the whole society, as in my presentation, where the uh, high level uh, leaders um, is chair uh, for the national committee for COVID nineteen prevention. So, um, because it is maybe in Vietnam, we have uh, the single parties. So the direction come from the, the party to the government. Uh, 
uh, so it is um, uh, have the high consensus and 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 um, very strong um, guidance and and com uh, com commitment from the the high level um, policy makers and 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 government leaders. Um, so um, we see that political commitment is very important point to to make sure that the uh, successful of the COVID prevention, COVID prevention in Vietnam. Thank so you so have, much. Thank you so okay, much, my one. Let, yeah. Let's okay. let's have uh, the other voices also. Doctor So, you want to comment on this question? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I take a little bit different view. Uh, in in what you mean by compliance to the COVID uh, behaviors. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we also found uh, that uh, some of the stringent measures did not necessarily lead to effective COVID-19 control. So the, the leadership here, the leadership is very important in deciding when to impose a lockdowns and how to enforce the uh, procedures and of lockdowns and uh, quarantines and all, all the enforcements. And then the enforcements also cannot be prolong or cannot be relaxed uh, before uh, it needs to be lifted. So I think, uh, to me, I think the, the leadership is very critical in making all these enforcement decisions and making sure that uh, when tough uh, regulations and tough measures are enforced, it is thoroughly followed. And uh, it's also they need to know when to lift the thing, lift all these restrictions when the time is up. Thank you so much. And I think, uh, in conclusion, here it depends on the quality of the leadership. Uh, we have another question regarding accountability. We'll soon get there. But maybe if uh, someone from Bangladesh would like to, not all of you, but uh, someone would like to make a comment here, please uh, go ahead. Just take the word. Uh, so regarding the, the question about the political uh, leadership, yeah. I think, um, I mean, a, I mean, usually any political leadership uh, generally wants to um, do bring good to the people. I mean, the decisions may be wrong, but it's actually not that they intend to do something um, wrong by by default. It's a matter of like uh, the stand they take and the mindset they have. So it's important that the political leadership actually consults with the scientific, um, uh, the scientific, um, the community uh, to make those decisions instead of um, doing this decision, making those decisions based on their political um, whims or political position only. The decisions, the political decisions are important, but those need to be uh, based on the scientific evidence and scientific orientation. Thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you, for your contributions. It's obvious to say, isn't it, uh, the importance of what we just heard. And just look at, uh, you know, COVID-19 has unveiled inequities uh, that we didn't know. But it has also unveiled uh, misperceptions. The country with most resources, okay? The country with most resources, so much money, so much healthcare, and you know which country I'm alluding to. So resistant to science. Now, uh, Sabina, I think we had a question. I don't want to lose that on accountability. So, which part? But before is that, what we're talking about. Sorry, before that, Yoran, there's a general question to everyone because the accountability is to Vietnam. Can yeah. I read out the general question to all speakers? Please what do. can we learn? from last year's experiences of the Omicron situation in South Africa, in quotation, and what measures can reduce such gaps between evidence-based LMICs and government responses, both at the regional and international levels in the future? That was a tough, that? tough call. Who wants, to, who wants to go ahead with this? And it's a large question, but we don't have time for very uh, long answers. So who wants to take up this challenge? Please uh, be bold. You are very skilled, all of you. 
Anyone wants to share on lessons learned or any measures that reduce gaps between evidences and government responses? I think you all shared different. You can have go to the next two questions and come back to this one, Yoran. Yeah, yes. But I, I actually think the question is extremely large. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we can let's see uh, what we can do with it. I mean, one very one very obvious uh, response, and and I can't let uh, let it become a cliffhanger. Uh, one very obvious response is uh, related to this uh, uh, issue of not only transparency uh, but also international solidarity, and uh, uh, you know don't control the media in a way that you don't blame a country, uh, especially as you don't have uh, international evidence enough. Let's take the question on accountability. So one of the questions is about, um, uh, okay, let me just find the accountability was earlier. So to Dr. Tran, what does accountability mean at different levels of organization? individual citizens breaking official measures or local communities and let me uh, if if i may add on as in uh, one of the bmj papers we published uh, on this issue uh, and going through accountability i find accountability a very nice concept in theory but very hard to develop in practice and actually not that many concrete examples of well-functioning accountability. So let's listen to my one, over to yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you very much. So um, uh, relating to the accountability in Vietnam, first first thing is that um, in, uh, for example, in the COVID-19 preventions, we identify uh, clearly responsibility of each stakeholders so the stakeholders, they know their responsibilities. And also we identified what information needs to be reported and shared between the stakeholders. Um, and, and also uh, identify who do they need to report with. So in terms of the COVID-19 prevention, the information is very transparent and clearly and, and, and reported um, uh, frequently. So, so um, um, here, the accountability is the identify responsibility of each stakeholders and, and the information that they need to share with, with the public. Thank you so much. Let me add one thing that I learned when I started working in Vietnam in 1992. We had a large EU project. And then a very distinguished professor colleague from Vietnam. I didn't know him since before. He stood up the first day of the meeting and he said, Joran, I'm a very informal guy. Joran, I don't want NATO. And I was thinking, what does he mean? NATO, the military alliance. I have nothing to do with that. And I asked him, what do you mean? And he said, no action, talk only. No action, talk only. And I think this is extremely relevant for our session risk communication, data for decision-making, but then how does this lead to evidence-based governance? And that link, the knowledge translation to get action is uh, absolutely essential uh, uh, in this process. Let's have another question, please. Okay, so there's another question directed to Dr. Tran. Um, experiences of community engagement and combating COVID-19 from different countries is quite varied. What are the key factors that motivated the community to respond to the government's efforts in Vietnam? Yeah, um, for, for this point, uh, uh, um, in order, in order to, to make the community um, to engage actively in COVID-19 preventions, um, we, um, we encourage them, we provide information for them and, and to help them uh, to improve their awareness on, on the disease and empower them. It means that in, in the community, um, we, 
when we introduce the, the prevention measures, but um, we, we empower them and, and the community leaders, they are responsible for, um, for, for uh, guiding for, for the people in the community and also supporting the people to implement and monitoring is in place. Um, and, and so that they can support each other in, in, in applying the different methods for preventing COVID. Thank you so much. Let's take the next question. Uh, there was a general question I asked, but I will leave that to you because you're going to ask the speakers. There's another one for Dr. Tran. I think there's a lot of interest in Vietnam. Uh, so we see from your presentation that ministries were involved from different sectors. But how inclusive were these ministries in taking public health experts' opinions into consideration? Yeah, uh, I can give an example on this. Um, uh, uh, in, in Vietnam, we are going to introduce vaccination for the children um, from five to 11 years old. So uh, even the government have clear uh, strategy in providing uh, vaccination for these um, children groups, uh, but uh, we still have strategy to obtain the opinion from the public and um, the government um, uh, introduce, not introduce, ask us, uh, like a conduct a survey um, to obtain the op public opinions on, on, on the and acceptance on the uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. So the public um, opinions, um, they, they, they have the, the voice and they have a channel to, to raise their voice uh, and opinions on this. So, so uh, in, in to the COVID, um, the public opinion is one of channels that, that um, um, we, uh, we see that it is very important and, and one of channels for us to obtain the information from them before giving the decision. Thank you, my one. Uh, Sabine, if I may kindly ask you if you can find at least one question that is directed to Bangladesh. Uh, colleagues okay, and so one there's a general is, question uh, wait, wait wait a sec and one Sorry. is directed to our Myanmar colleague over to you Sabina okay so I would say then maybe to well, there was a general question on what are the implications for risk communications in these country contexts Myanmar we could look at Bangladesh any reflections as we move forward thank you Dr. So you want to go did you understand the question Yes, um, in, in our case, uh, again, the, the basic gap uh, in, in the communication is the, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Thompson just emphasized, the trust in the system. So when we don't uh, have, we have a very low trust in the system, then it would be very difficult to, um, uh, you know, uh, communicate effectively with the public. And then, of course, in our case, uh, vaccination is supposed to be a very uh, a good strategy to build the trust from the public. But uh, on the other hand, uh, why the, the government is trying to roll out more and more vaccines uh, with the purchase uh, from China in our case, uh, it hasn't really uh, done effective communication to, uh, to mitigate the risk. So I think that two strategies has to go hand in hand, I guess. Thank you so much for that very clear uh, response. Uh, anybody from uh, Bangladesh that would like uh, to share views? Yes, Tofik Jay. Um, yes. Um, uh, Regarding uh, Bangladesh, actually different NGOs and even the government actually took um, several measures in terms of risk communication and community empowerment. And these are all good and we appreciate that. But the problem is that there should be um, a strategy, a central and um, a sort of um, a concrete strategy on how to um, uh, do this, um, this communication work so that everybody can follow it. And uh, these are aligned with um, everyone else's uh, activities and there is no reinvention of the wheel. So my point is that, I mean, there are activities in terms of risk communication and there are some good works there, but it needs to be harmonized and there should be a clear um, um, uh, strategy for that. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, pose two questions to each of your uh, presenters. But before that, uh, Sabina, do we have one or two more sharp questions that you want? No, to the convey? questions are all the questions I've gone through. There was about okay. unless there's a recent one, but I don't see any. Let me just quickly okay, check. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, there's no. still room for it, but then uh, let no me questions. Ask. Let minutes. me ask yeah. each and every one of the presenters. And we go, I'm not going to ask for volunteers. We go in the same order as you presented. Huh? I have two questions for you. The first question is, what did you learn from any of the other presenters? And just give one example. I don't want to know everything. We don't have time for that. But what did you learn from any so, of the other presenters that's the first question the second question is i just want one suggestion what's the most important and this is a hopeless question you have to you have to forgive me what's in your opinion the most important issue strategy whatever in order to achieve evidence-based governance in your own context. So the first question is, what did you learn from others? And the second question, what's the most important aspect of reaching evidence-based governance in your context? So we'll start with uh, Tofik J. Uh, thank you, Goran. Um, so I, I particularly, I mean, all the presentations were great, but I was particularly interested in the Vietnam presentation by Professor uh, Wan because um, it was actually uh, 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 an example country for uh, good COVID management, and I learned how the government, the leadership, and the multi-sectorality um, contributed to community empowerment, and the community actually took care of itself in 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 mitigating the covid um uh, covid um issues and covid management it worked quite well so that connection was very clear from her presentation and that was actually a, a good thing um thanks for that and in regards to your second question the suggestion the most important thing or the most important uh strategy uh, for evidence-based governance is that it's important to understand it's important to realize that covid is a public health issue and it needs to be addressed through a public health lens, not a clinical lens. So unfortunately, Bangladesh has a, a, a health sector which is very much dominated by the clinical biomedical sort of um, approach. And we uh, it's difficult to believe for international audience that we don't have a public health track in our health system. So health means clinical health. There is no room for public health professionals. And that was reflected in every uh, single uh, strategy, every single decision that uh, that were being taken, at the, especially at the initial day. So, I mean, it's very important. Thank you realize. so much. Very, very clear, very important. Dr. So, your turn. And you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Y yes, Professor. Um, yeah, um, again, <laughs> Uh, as I compare Myanmar with Cambodia, and I'm also quite uh, inspired by Vietnam, you know, successful uh, COVID-19 control. And uh, of course, uh, right now, uh, you know, within the ASEAN, uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam have a different political system. And uh, this is, you can see clearly the how one party uh, state or governments are achieving a very effective uh, COVID-19 control and response. And, but uh, unfortunately, when Myanmar tried to imitate that approach, we not only, uh, you know, failed to do that, uh, but also draw a very large international criticism for taking such a path. Uh, nonetheless, I think uh, we have no choice, but uh, we have to take a whole of government approach and mobilize all the uh, you know, the, including the defense forces to really bring uh, the responses more effectively. Uh, for, for, for the second question, you know, my, if, if I may, I 
just wanted to uh, bring back uh, the evidence-based policy making. I think vaccination uh, seems to be the most important and decisive factor in uh, controlling the COVID-19. And then, um, you know, uh, I, I've been advocating my own government to take a more seriously on this and even try to purchase the vaccines as much as possible to try to go ahead and uh, do the campaigns more of, uh, for on our own resources. Because, you know, uh, as you can see in our uh, previous year reports, uh, we have a very willing population who wants to take the vaccines. And then all you have to do is to vaccinate them and try to prove that uh, such a, a vaccination can bring uh, good results in terms of uh, controlling the death rates and then also controlling the pandemic. So perhaps this is what, uh, uh, this is how Myanmar can respond and this is how the region can help Myanmar. Thank you so much, Dr. So I remind the, the other presenters that we have to end within like five minutes. So, uh, Tofikul Islam, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I think uh, the most important thing uh, I, I think uh, was that how the community uh, uh, approach can help uh, uh, addressing. I, I always use this word addressing COVID-19 because it has many uh, shades, multifaceted uh, impacts and its implications. So uh, I think uh, this approach of whole of society approach that we uh, bookishly say, but it is very, very important as well. Uh, the most important issue, I think in terms of uh, strat strategy, uh, this is something we have, we should, if I have learned one thing in last two years, I think the more uh, transparent you are in your uh, decision-making, the more transparent you are in terms of taking uh, decisions, I, I think you are more successful because people, uh, people's trust will be very, very important. I think we have talked about the vaccines, but we also think that uh, people's, uh, I think, policymakers' attitude, behavior, their sensitization, and people's behavior, uh, sensitizations, and their actions will actually determine how long we are going to face this pandemic. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. My one? Um, yes. I'm very impressed with the presentation from um, Dr. Islam Khan, um, where uh, he saw the uh, the um, the data the the data initiative. Um, it, it can show that the data should be available uh, for for the policymaker in in making decision. Um, so I am I, I can see that uh, like uh, um, they mentioned he mentioned about the the dashboard in in. Uh, uh, COVID-19, so it can it can um, help the 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 uh, the uh, decision maker to to um, uh, to give um, right decision. Um, so uh, it it is also related to the second question. Uh, what is the strategy to um, uh, the the, the uh, good uh, governance? Strategy? Yeah, one yeah. more minute. Yeah. So so I think uh, in, important strategy here is that we should make the data available. And, and transparencies in terms of the COVID-19 um, situation. Yeah, so the evidence should be based on the data. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let me then conclude, and I will conclude in this way. Thank you so much, each presenter. It has been a absolute joy, pleasure for me to facilitate this uh, one and a half hour. I've learned a lot. And uh, what I started off saying uh, that uh, we can expect learning from you, uh, you proved I was right. So uh, once again, thank you so much. Good luck in your future work. Hope to be able to in one way or the other interact with you. And I have a humble uh, proposal for you. You know, this might be a start of something. You're a very interesting quartet. Why not think of drafting, maybe with the support of uh, BRAC, drafting a small note, a kind of uh, 
cross-country comparison. Some major take-home messages are very obvious to me. I started off uh, listing a number of concepts. But I don't want to add on work uh, to you. I'm sure already very busy schedule. So um, thank you so much for generous, transparent, and good communication of data. Some of the data a bit sensitive. Uh, the trust that uh, you have shown in the audience uh, excellent. And finally, thank you to the audience. At some stage, we had 101 participants, and uh, I think uh, you should uh, take credit of that. Of course, also, finally, thank you to the organizers. I started off saying that Noshin and others have done an excellent preparatory work. So. If Noshin is, if you're listening in, thank you. And thank you, Sabine. Thank you, Masoud. And good luck to everybody. Joran, I wanted to share, we will be sharing brief conference proceedings from the three days. So that will make you happy. Thank you very much for sharing. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Professor Thompson. And also thank